This is about growing tomatoes outdoors in a coolish temperate climate. So I'm in the southern UK where our climates are not, our summers are not hot. We average in summer afternoons not much more than 21, 22 degrees. 22 degrees, that's low 70s, would already be a very pleasant warm day. I'll give you an idea today is, well, we're just nudging 21. This is the middle of May and it's about the time normally we plant things like tomatoes outside because they're killed by frost so you wait until your last frost date has passed any time from middle of may for much of the uk i know in parts of scotland it could be early june so you have to pay attention to those microclimate details and then the question of ground preparation this is no dig here we're actually in my small garden at homemakers and no dig makes it really simple for succession so for example this morning there was purple sprouting broccoli here that I've been picking over the last five weeks and I took a final harvest the spears are getting quite thin the new shoots are getting small so it's not worth leaving it in the ground much longer and I want the ground for my tomatoes so I twisted them out and that way the ground's not been disturbed too much I actually did walk on it a bit you can do this with no dig beds just if you've disturbed the ground from pulling something out even though I was twisting more than pulling it caused a bit of more ground disturbance than I'd like. So I want to push this all back down, keep it all together. That's firm, not compact. Then I, occasionally I'll use the rake. I was just looking at it, actually, this is pretty optional, but if anything, just to get it a bit level. And doing this, sometimes you get a feeling of where the soil might be dry. And before the filming earlier this morning, I did water here, because where there's been plants like broccoli in a dry spring, such as we've had, they pull a lot of moisture out and it's good to give some water before you even do your new planting it's kind of easier you can just do a general water and you don't need to worry about nutrients running away with no dig again that doesn't happen it's all the compost and everything is holding nutrients in water in soluble form so there we have our bit of ground uh, i'm actually going to give it a bit more water because I, before i put the compost on even i'm going to put some new compost on you see how the water's soaking in well as well that's characteristic of no dig soil you normally get very good drainage, you know, from not disturbing it. And then you might have noticed there's two tomato plants there already, which I'd popped in as plug plants just to see two and a half weeks ago. That they were under the broccoli. I forgot about them. They've survived. Mm. And they might grow to be nice tomatoes. They're a variety called Dorinia, which is bred as an outdoor tomato. So that means that it will, sh will grow or should grow in cooler weather. So this is homemade compost, which I've taken from a heap that we made last autumn, turned once around in November actually, quite a while ago. And I've pulled out the bigger bits of wood, but I don't mind little bits. I've not sieved it. I've not, this compost has not been sifted or anything. This is just how it's come out of the heap, but I've broken down any lumps or bigger lumps and I'm looking to put on around two and a half centimetres an inch. Very hard thing to quantify that. You know, how do you actually measure compost? And do you wait until it, once it's been rained on, for example, it settles down. This is quite dry and fluffy, so it's standing up a bit. Uh, but this for me is getting close to, yeah, well, I'm going to put the rest on since I'm here. Uh, because <laughs> it won't hurt the tomatoes, that's for sure, to have a little bit extra. And even the sort of thing you can do is you can underplant tomatoes with spinach in August. We'll have a look at that nearer the time. So there we are. One other thing going on here is uh, overwintered surviving snapdragons may or may not survive. I don't mind if they do or they don't. Or I hope they do because um, I like them. But it's not the end of the world if they don't. Again, Noda gives you these options because you haven't got to dig over your ground. So, if, you know, if, you want, if there's a few plants there you're happy to keep, then they can stay. Right, so that's Dorinia. Uh, choice of variety. <laughs> Such a wealth of choices, aren't they? And these two I thought might be interesting. Uh, this one's actually called, wait a minute, this is one. Richard's egg yolk cherry. Richard's the son, I think it is, of one of my followers. And 
So his mother sent me this, oh no, it might have been Richard actually, if it's, if it's your apology to Richard, but it comes from that family, egg yolk cherry, so we'll bright yellow. And then this one, um, I'll need to put a link up to this, I can't remember the name of the people, but they, they're in Wiltshire and they run a tomato specialist tomato company, and this one is called Yuko's Persimmon Cross Lilia's Perfection. <laughs> and I think it's, I think it's going to be an egg yolk, and I'm prepared to take that risk. Uh, I take a few gambles planting tomatoes because it's often fun to see what happens. This one I'm pretty sure <laughs> we got in the mix with labels as usual. I'm pretty sure that's sun gold. Now, I like sun gold. I recommend sun gold. I hope it is because you'll see it comes quite early. We're going to revisit this in a couple of months, see how they do. You'll see the stakes we put in as well. Um, most of these are cordon tomatoes, so they, they'll grow up to about that high and we'll, we'll tie them to a stake with a bit of side shooting. This one also was supposed to be sun gold, but it doesn't look like it to me. The, the truss looks a bit bigger. The, I think it might be a beef tomato. Ah, so there we'll see. We'll, we'll all learn something. And I'll just finish today by popping in these plants. <clears throat> You'll see that I've not done anything more than just put the compost on. Um, it's gone on moist ground, so that, that's a good start. And if it wasn't going to rain, I would give a general water after planting because I want this compost to kind of soak into the ground a bit and become very accessible to um, soil organisms through being moist. Here's an interesting thing. This root ball is nearly all dry. I'm feeling how light it is. That is fine. When you're watering plants in pots like this, they don't have to be wet all the time and actually it can be better that they're not because that helps to keep some air around the roots. I'm putting it in pretty deep. That's partly to make watering easier. Leave a little hole around the stem, which also facilitates that. It means the water doesn't run away. And doing these holes also gives me the chance to see what the soil is like. And again, pretty dry here around the edge. Quite stony too, I don't know if you can hear that. This, this small garden is um, on the site of a combination of gravel paths and boiler buildings from when this was a nursery in the 1960s and 70s. So the soil is really good on top and I've made it good from adding compost. But underneath it's quite gravelly and even bits of glass and things. And it really again makes me glad I'm not digging it over in a general way. Just the old hole like this. See the bits of gravel that are coming out there. But Sometimes we're trying to put stakes in. We might have a bit of a job to put the tomato stakes in because of the dryness. Obviously, oh, uh, sorry, the gravel and stone and rock. And goodness knows what else is down there. This one I'll keep the label because I've never grown it before and I want to be reminded what it is. And that one too. So we've got a little bit of certainty there. This is another Dorinia. And one other thing I'm not going to do here. This, by the way, um, People have a laugh sometimes. <laughs> like I put up a video about how to plant a no-dig potato. and uh, I'm digging a little hole in there. They say, you know, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> I can see their point, but with no dig, you occasionally you've got to do a bit of digging. What I'm doing with these holes is being as tidy as possible. I've cut four corners around the square of the root ball, and then it slides in with as little root disturbance as possible. The roots are then gonna happily travel, they do happily travel, you can see by the growth that happens, into the firm, undisturbed soil nearby. And spacing is another issue because you might have noticed I'm putting these pretty close. Spacings that are given light on seed packets, oh that one's dry as well, I'll make a note of that, mental note, um, if you get a dry one give it more water after planting. Uh, the spacings assume, I reckon, that your tomatoes are going to have a long season to grow in and be able to explore all the soil and space around them. Whereas in the UK, much of the UK anyway, as we found last summer 2021, the biggest potential problem is late blight. And that uh, last year that happened in August. And so August is when mostly the fruit are developing and you get the first ripe tomatoes and then you've got late blight. It's like you, you can lose a crop. So there's an element of gamble here. It's why I don't do too many tomatoes outside, but it's always fun. And the spacing, 
because there's that risk of disease and the season is so short, they don't actually need so much room really because they haven't got time to fully explore the soil and the space um, in the way that say a courgette might because it's so fast growing. These, these are slower growing. I'm gonna take them up to let them grow up with side shooting till they're about that high, but the, the key point is August the 10th, you'll see. That's when I'm gonna pinch out the tops. And that way you, you don't let them grow too for too long before the blight might arrive. Well, we hope it won't. <laughs> There's no way of knowing. So I look forward to seeing you back here at some point in the summer. I'm just checking for side shoots and tying in the plants. It's now the 13th of June and the weather has been average, so that's okay. Our summer days are not that often warm. We've had temperature no higher than 23 centigrade, 73 Fahrenheit. And so that's slow, steady growth and there's no worries yet about blight. And the tying in I'm doing is it's quite time consuming, <laughs> at least the way I'm doing it here. So I'm putting a, a tie every 10 to 15 centimeter, four to six inches as they grow up the stake. And this one looks like sun gold. I did lose my net labels, but I'm gonna know once they start fruiting. And you can see the fruit are already developing and one thing I'm going to do here with the bottommost truss, I'm going to take off the end of it. You can see how the tomatoes are quite good up to that point and then suddenly they're not. Yeah. And if you do that, remove that bit, it gives you these ones more chance of ripening quite quickly while the plant is still growing. Because at this time of year now, the tomatoes are doing everything. They're growing, they're starting to make fruit and it won't be long before they also need to ripen their fruit. So you need to make sure they're well watered. I'm seeing here that this ground is quite dry. We haven't watered much. We've had, eight days ago, we had 24 millimeters, nearly an inch of rain. So that was brilliant. And I haven't really looked at them since then, but I'm looking at them now and thinking, hmm, they're a little bit dry. They could do with some water. So it's clearly not vital. It, in bright sunlight, they haven't been wilting or anything, but I'm just keeping them moist without overwatering. That's pretty much my rule of thumb for everything. <laughs> Makes life simpler, less watering. And you can see by the side shoot, if you haven't done it before, you're looking for these little new growths out of the side of the plant where the leaf joins the main stem. And here's another truss. This one, actually, I could have taken one off before now, but that one's, yeah, there's one I take off. That little one is just struggling to make it, but the rest of these look pretty good. And that's about it for now. It's just looking after them, side shooting, tying them in as and when they need it, keeping them watered. I'm not feeding. <laughs> I don't feed my tomatoes, but they're on quite a wide spacing, you can see here. So that helps. I'll leave that up to you to decide whether you want to feed them or not. You're gonna see here when we come back, you'll see the result of not feeding, but with the compost mulch on top. And I'll finally mention the two at the back are pretty close together. They were put in very on spec when there was still broccoli here. And I'm leaving them there quite close because behind them, <clears throat> the peas close to the edge of that bed have died for whatever reason. And that means there's more space behind them they can root into and, and even grow into. One more job that's worth doing is removing the lower leaves. I, as a rule of thumb, I take off leaves up to the bottommost truss. So this one, they often snap off. The fact when they snap off is a sign that they're kind of ready to go. So this is a leaf, you kind of know it's not doing much for the plants anymore. It's, it's losing, losing or lost color. It's going a bit spotty. If you see problems like spots on your lower leaves, don't worry too much. You know, it's probably not anything to worry about. It's the, the action all happens. The important bit is at the top of the plant. 80% of the photosynthesis is happening at that top end. So these lower leaves are not doing much anymore. And it means that there's less leaf area to take water from the soil. There's probably less chance of blight. You know, there's less bit of plant doing anything. And even a leaf like that, I could take off. I'll leave it for now, but that won't be long. You can see the end of that leaf is starting to go a bit spotty. So I'll be going through here and doing a bit of de-leafing. And we'll come back here in about a month, I reckon, when I'm hoping there'll be a few ripe fruit, the first ones, and we'll have a weather report as well, because that's the key thing for growing outdoor tomatoes in a temperate climate. It's five weeks 
since we were here. You can see there's a bit has happened. I'm going to work my way through. We've, we've really harvested some of these. They're beautiful. We got in a muddle over <laughs> varieties. I've grown so many and the labels got switched around. These are either egg yolk or persimmon. I favour the latter because they taste a bit like persimmon. You see, I'm cutting whole trusses. Uh, you can harvest tomatoes when they're just turning colour. It's called breaking stage. Uh, tomatoes ripen from the inside out. So you've got that's riper than it looks and it finishes ripening like in your house and it takes the strain off the plant and you can see how on this one these leaves are not looking brilliant if this happens to you don't worry the reason for it is I'm pretty sure that I let too many fruits like all of those develop on a very small plant really and it it put a big strain on the plant and it kind of went through a phase of struggling and now it's looking okay again actually and what I would do, even now, is thin these, thin this truss, even take two out, because the, this plant is not quite at 100%. I need to water it more. I have been watering, actually, that feels quite moist. But we've had a lot of hot weather, and as a result, I mean, look at this, beautiful. That whole truss I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna cut off, so it's de-leafing, still, side shooting there's a side shoot I missed <laughs> I just noticed now there's another one I missed they, they shoot out so fast at this time of year don't worry if you miss one but tomatoes are kind of very ongoing there's always more tidying de-leafing this is the sun gold you can see we've already taken a whole truss I'll cut off the empty truss when it's finished Pick those fruits that are ripe. Sun gold's beautiful, sweet little fruit. You can see very different to those. Uh, early as well. I mean, this one's done well for being so early. The other thing I'm doing at this time of year is taking out the tops. That might look like vandalism. It feels it a bit, actually. But for one thing here, it can be quite windy as we go into autumn. I don't want the plants to be too tall, the risk blowing over. But secondly, when you've got trusses like this, towards the end of July. That's giving time in our climate, not normally very hot, to for the, all those fruits to both grow and to ripen. So there's less chance of lots of unused green fruit. I know you can use green tomatoes, but I, I want ripe ones. And there's always that overhanging risk of blight. So I'm just going through all of them now. I'll take the tip above, so that's leaving that little truss there. And some of these at the back are taller varieties. So actually I'm going to take it down a bit. Uh, also because they haven't actually ripened yet. I would have done this even a couple of days ago. I was waiting for the video to do this, but I want to give you the idea. And don't be afraid of doing this because, yeah, you're, you're stopping the plant basically. It's, it can't grow anymore that way. But what it can do is now put all its energy into swelling the fruits. And the other thing, brief thing to mention at this point is the trusses and how big they are. Sun gold, for example, here's a nice example. That's all one truss. And if I let every single fruit develop on that, it might take a very long time for those last ones to ripen. I quite often take out just that little tip because that way there's more energy goes into the ones closer to the plant and you you get bigger nicer fruit and they ripen more quickly so there's a range of options mid-july and then we'll come back towards the end of august probably and hopefully there'll be no blight but where we're heading to now august that's where it gets risky the weather gets more humid and it stays warm so we'll see It's now mid-August and look at this, <laughs> they've grown really well. But I've been very lucky with the weather. This year, summer 2022, has been pretty hot recently. We've had just had a week of close to 30 centigrade temperatures, mid 80s Fahrenheit, which for us is pretty unusual. And also for the last six weeks, it's been pretty dry. Hence no blight, no late blight yet. 
In the last six weeks, we've had just five millimeters of rain, one fifth of an inch. So I've been watering regularly, which you need to do with tomatoes because they're thirsty plants, but I've not been feeding. So this is the result of just using compost mulch, no feeds or fertilizers. You can see I've been deleafing and shortening trusses, particularly on the sun gold, because like I've taken an end off that truss there, for example, and that helps the fruits which remain, which is still a lot of fruit, to get to a decent size. And otherwise you risk having some fruits that never really make nice fruit and that takes energy from the plant. So little things like that can make quite a difference, being realistic to your soil and situation. And putting on the waters, been helping because I've been doing one more thing under the plants, which is I'm already thinking what's going to grow next with these tomatoes. And I've decided to put some coriander on the end of this bed, which will grow through the autumn and should survive the winter. And likewise spinach. So this is Medania spinach, sown two weeks ago, multi-sown in modules. And it's three days since I put them in the ground. It gives you a clue that they are actually grown a bit, but they go in pretty small, which is totally fine. And you can see that there's a tomato root, for example. So that spinach there, that spinach plant, won't grow a lot at the moment, which is totally fine. It doesn't need to. It's just getting its roots down around and through the tomato roots. They might even be helping each other. This interplanting is such a beautiful method. And then by mid-October, I reckon, it might be sooner, when I come to remove the tomato plants, I can just cut at the base, even using a sharp trowel. Sorry, plant. <laughs> It'll be finishing by then. And that will leave the spinach unaffected and it will, you know, there'll be a spinach harvest here by late October, very soon after the tomatoes finish. So these tomatoes have got, well, how long to go? We don't know for sure. It depends when late blight arrives. That's the main governing factor. I've already pinched out the tops of the plants and that means they can't make any more new fruit now. I've shortened the trusses. The main ongoing job is removing any side shoot that you see. That's important because otherwise the plant's wasting energy trying to grow new stems. And they will keep doing that. Once you've pinched out the tops, they keep making side shoots. And just make sure they're well supported. So I put in a, a couple of top bars there where the plants were growing up. Even after you pinched out the top, they, they do carry on growing upwards. And then there was fruit developing at the top of the plant can be so heavy that it pulls the plant over and to my horror about three days ago one of those plants had snapped almost in the middle and it looked snap anyway I managed to lift it up still connected and put the horizontal bar in across two of the verticals and rested the plant on that and it's still looking really healthy actually it's amazing what plants can do in that way you know it's just a little connection is enough so now I'm going to do a big pick this is how much fruit has grown in six days since uh, the last pick and we'll see what we get. There's sun gold and uluru yellow and dorinia is the red one. Now 26 days later and I'm very pleased with progress we've had Quite a lot of warm weather in our terms warmer than usual night temperatures above 10 centigrade 50 fahrenheit and daytime temperatures 20 centigrade 70s fahrenheit i've been watering a little because it's been very dry but not over watering i don't want the fruit to the, i don't want the plants to put on a lot of fleshy growth as they come towards the end of their life so keep the watering as little as possible in that stage of your tomatoes I have needed to water though to keep the spinach and coriander alive and that has worked because also then we had quite a bit of rain from 10 days ago to three days ago, nearly two inches, 46 millimeters. So I noticed then how much the spinach suddenly grew. If you can often, if you keep seedlings just alive, you know, then as soon as it rains a bit, they'll really grow like a rocket. Fantastic. So what remains to do now is um, I've been also side shooting, keeping the plants tidy and oh i must mention the leaf roll um, that's on this variety here dorinia and you'll notice there's very little leaf roll still a bit but nothing to worry about really on the sun gold but i'm not worrying about that either actually because i'm still getting lovely fruit and 
it's you know it's not having a significant effect There's, i think often um i get questions a lot about you know imperfections in tomato plants and people are worried because they don't look perfect and that's okay <laughs> and you know as long as the the leaves are generally green generally even you can have spots and things that's still all right and as long as the fruits are looking nice yeah you're okay one thing this variety does sun gold is it splits and that's a varietal trait as well so they're not all doing it here but the sun gold is prone to that so it, all that is the result of is it being quite dry and then suddenly it's rain and the fruits have taken on so much water that the skin is split because sun gold skin is quite tender and thin which means it makes it nice to eat so there's many ways of looking at that one as well i like the split ones it's often the split ones that are the sweetest and blossom end rot, I must mention too, because that can be the result of really dry conditions. It's often said that it's not enough calcium in the soil. And that's kind of true. It's not enough calcium in the plant though. And that's mainly from there not being enough water to get the calcium up to the fruit. So if you are suffering blossom end rot, which is a black, very ugly black patch that can be quite big at the bottom of a tomato fruit, uh, you can still eat the top part, by the way, uh, but the black patch uh, means you need to water more, basically. So you tend to see it in, in heat waves, sudden, hot, dry weather, and, and then, then you need to pile on the water. I mean, tomatoes are thirsty plants, but at the stage we're at now, where there isn't any new growth needed, and where I've been removing a lot of leaves, so there isn't a lot of leaf on some of these now, they don't need anything like so much water. And in fact, if it hadn't rained, 10 days ago and recently I would have carried on with my minimal watering regime and these fruits would probably be even the riper so don't overdo the watering as the plants come to the end of their lives. Uh, there's also a bit of unhealthy leaf here on this yellow one. I haven't said a lot about that because I've been a bit unclear about exactly what it is. I was given seeds by um, a company called Tomato Revolution, Re really great pioneering people who are developing new varieties and that's one that they call an F2 which means it's an F1 hybrid crossed with something else. <laughs> uh, or grown out, actually. I think more strictly, it's grown out from the seed of an F1 hybrid plant. You, you get a bit of a mix. And in fact, that one of the breeders was here last week and he was very interested to see this. And uh, I'll put the name on the screen so I can't remember it actually off the top of my head, it's quite long. Um, the fruit are nice, but look at the leaves. They don't look brilliant, but I'm, again, I'm not too worried because the fruit tastes nice and that's the main thing. I'm actually keeping a few seeds from this to see what it does. I won't keep seeds from the sun gold because that's a hybrid. I am keeping seeds of this one, Dorinia, because it's, it tolerates cold climates. So you can see how well it's done here, even though we've had a warm summer. I think it would have done well last year. So the picking at this stage is just the same as usual with one exception that I'm going to pick. Oh, that one didn't come off. Uh, less right. So... A fruit like that, it's not red, but it's breaking, it's called. It's, it's going red, it's, it's showing that tendency. If you compare that to a bright green one, like over there, we can show you on screen. They, that is, is half ripe, if not more, and that will finish ripening inside no problem. What it means is that I can now clear the plant, because I want to show you that. How, how do you clear a tomato plant when you've got other plants growing underneath like we have here and I'm first cutting the strings holding this onto the staking so now this plant is loose and what I can do is cut around the roots. You could do this with a trowel. It's just a question of getting this out with minimal disturbance of the plant roots. Uh, sorry, of the spinach roots, I should say. Leaving most of the tomato plants in the ground. And this does work well for no dig. So that's how much I'm removing. And most of the tomato roots are still in the ground. And then when I take this to the compost heap, I'm gonna slice it into four to six inch, 10, 15 centimeter lengths. And that will decompose more quickly. In fact, with a knife, you can slice it horror on a diagonal that's easier than cutting across and that exposes more surface area to the bacteria. And basically now we're, we're left with 
the lovely scenario of the next planting. The spinach, coriander growing. We've had a lovely tomato harvest. Uh, some of these plants, the sungold, I might leave for another week, but all the dorinia I'm going to take out. And there we are.